as the oversaturated Metroidvania genre continues to absorb and assimilate more of the planet's surface, Blasphemous remains one of its highest peaks. The game excelled with its horrifying religious art and ability to keep its open world compelling throughout, and the sequel is driven by those very same qualities. There's been no major change in tone or approach, and most areas even stick closely to the look of those from the first game. Those that do try new directions tend to be the more interesting ones. I could almost fault how iterative Blasphemous 2 is, but the art is too damn good to complain, and the growth is readily apparent when comparing an early forest area from each game. It already felt like the developers had a strong grasp on what they were doing before, but the better handle on color and perspective makes the atmosphere even deeper. They've also topped the relentless weirdness of the first game with another truckload of Catholic nightmare fuel, but as gory as the experience is, it feels more fascinating than disgusting. The developers continue to take cues from local Spanish art and folklore to evoke specific emotions, not to cheaply shock. One big change is that cutscenes are fully animated now. I understand that this expands the possibilities compared to using pixel art, and it was apparently substantially cheaper and easier for the developers, but it makes the transitions back to gameplay more jarring. The developers made a point of committing to pixels for all content last time to create an authentic retro aesthetic, and it also just looked gross in a way that suited the game. This barely qualifies as a complaint though, and the anime storytelling is fine. You can apply a CRT filter if you want to test how authentic the pixel art really is. The first game shipped with a few options built in, but this time I had to use Reshade, which has the much better CRT Royale filter anyway. Shadow Play didn't capture it well, but objects definitely look rounder this way, and there's a better sense of depth to distant buildings. You also get the surprising effects like glowing eyes that scan lines can often bring, but the game looks great either way. The flamenco-heavy soundtrack is also more of the same, in the best possible way. The music is great to listen to on its own, but perfectly conforms to whatever the action on screen is. Some boss fights have the expected big, terrifying scores. But for a nimble sword duel, the music is stripped down to just percussive sounds, and it fits like a glove. More than its art, the thing that really made the first Blasphemous stand out to me was its open world. The game truly allowed you to wander wherever you wanted with few constraints. There weren't many of the power-up based obstructions typical to Metroid outside of a few optional pickups. The sequel behaves more like a real Metroidvania while remaining mostly open. There are far more dead ends that require backtracking later, and not just for secrets. Mandatory game progress is often blocked until a new ability is found. That said, you can still wander freely from area to area regardless of your status. You may be unable to enter large portions of a new zone, but the game never prevents you from making a meaningful amount of progress exploring the rest. This is the best of both worlds in my view. The obstructions lead to power-ups being more numerous and rewarding than the first game, and the pace is steadier since you're never at a loss for a destination. The game inundates you with so many power-ups that I always had at least three or four roadblocks I could revisit at any time. From new healing flasks, larger healing flasks, health and magic upgrades, weapon upgrades, stat-boosting rosary beads, and perk-granting figurines, Blasphemous 2 is loaded with secrets to find. It's impressive not only how densely packed the world is given its huge size, but how meaningful each and every pickup still is. This isn't Metroid, where a missile tank is a small drop in the bucket. In a game as punishing as this one, every millimeter extension of your health bar is something you'll feel and appreciate. The altarpieces also have synergistic effects when combined so even a piece you're not especially excited to find can still yield a worthwhile perk. And the pickups are split between quests in a way that makes all of them feel special. For example, there are only nine hidden sisters, so it always feels like a rare surprise when you find one. Each type of collectible is also hidden in a different way. The sisters lurk behind false walls, while cherubs float just out of view, and so on. So you're never doing too much of the same thing the same way. Compare this to dumping a thousand Korok seeds into one quest, and it becomes obvious why their appeal wears off so fast. You are an even worse critic than you are a player! And if you had any talent or skill, you would know that Zelda Tears of the Kingdom is a flawless masterpiece! Unlike anything the world has seen before! And furthermore... The NPCs that run these quests are also incredibly distinct and memorable, making it a joy to return to them with every haul. Nope. No, 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 no. Maybe no, joy no, isn't the right no, word. No, no. Objective markers are given, but they tend to be loose suggestions, not strict commands. I typically forgot about them and spent hours going wherever the map took me until I happened to land on one. The second half introduces goals that need to be completed in a linear order, but by then you're capable of so much backtracking that the world still feels wide open. 
My only criticism of the world is that the map doesn't mark vital points of interest, so you have to place icons for most characters yourself. Found power-ups are also never marked, but in this case I still found it pretty easy to reach 100% completion. I've never played an indie metroidvania that made exploring and collecting as satisfying and engrossing as this. For 20 straight hours, the game remained rewarding and fast-paced without any lulls. The combat has also seen modest tweaks while sticking closely to what worked last time. There are now three distinct weapons to use, each with their own special power to unlock areas of the map. Your starting choice will decide which obstacles you'll be able to clear first, adding some replay value to subsequent playthroughs. And there are gauntlets that layer all three weapon abilities together at once that are a lot of fun. There are some deliberate compromises as a result. The default sword can no longer swing upwards, which gets annoying but does give you an incentive to swap weapons frequently. The rapiers are more maneuverable but much weaker, though if you avoid damage long enough they gain an electric boost that can give them an edge. The mace is the most powerful and long-reaching but can't block or counter attacks. I found myself sticking to the plain sword the majority of the time, but all of the weapons are useful and fun to wield. A tough boss fight is one of the best times to experiment with them, since you can really gauge how the differences in speed or power change your performance. The bosses themselves are uniformly excellent. Challenging enough to die to multiple times, but never enough to get stuck on. They last just long enough to stress you out without droning on and becoming boring. The balancing is pitch perfect, and there are always saves nearby so you can jump right back in without the pace being spoiled by needless backtracking. The only part I didn't love is that you still have to recover ghosts during the fights. I've always loathed this mechanic, and it takes its toll on this game too. You can die in an area with rapidly changing terrain and find yourself unable to make your way back to the ghost without taking some extra long detour. These ghost fetching trips were among the very few times that the game was not fun to play, but the mechanic has improved dramatically compared to last time. My ghost never appeared on spikes or in midair or any other stupid location. Some trials have the courtesy to leave the ghost outside of the arena, and if you don't want to bother collecting it at all, you can just pay to restore yourself with no real penalty. The best feature of this mechanic is that the ghost restores health when collected. This adds strategic value to holding off on absorbing it during a boss in order to get a free heal later. It apparently worked this way in Blasphemous 1 as well, but I guess I never noticed it while dealing with the god-awful placements. It can still be a nuisance, but this is the first game to convince me that this mechanic has actual merit. The platforming gauntlets were another worrisome return that ended up being okay this time. The Blasphemous DLC added a lot of parkour trials that served as the buggiest and most irritating portions of the game. Those sorts of platforming challenges are part of the main campaign this time, but they're far more polished and enjoyable than before. In fact, I was never frustrated by a single one. I think the developers have a better sense of what their physics can and can't do, and where to push the difficulty and where to relax. It also helps that spikes are no longer fatal and instead just knock down some health and embarrass you. Some rough spots are about as bad as last time. Stunlocking is still obnoxiously common, usually happening when an enemy pins you near the edge of the screen. Attacks that are normally very simple to counter pile up on you while your character continuously goes through his recovery animation. You can easily trap yourself into this situation by landing a successful counter, as the dual swords do a lunge attack afterwards that puts you right in the danger zone. Just a few invincibility frames would prevent this and probably not ruin the difficulty otherwise. Enemies also tend to get buggy after going off screen for a moment, momentarily failing to respond or never coming back into view unless you manage to land a hit on them. There was at least one instance of an object failing to display while still being available to interact with, which is definitely not supposed to happen. A few of the ongoing quests have questionable conditions for completion. In an errand with two rewards, you can only redeem one per playthrough, leaving the second collectible with no apparent use. A shop allows you to trade for any missed items later, which I only found out about after looking it up. Just a tad more confirmation that the second item could no longer be redeemed would have saved some time and confusion. There's also a character that offers to help during boss fights. When something like that happens in a game like this, it should be assumed that accepting help is the bad choice. And it was in the first Blasphemous. But here it's flipped, and I don't consider this a spoiler because it's important information you have no way of knowing otherwise. You need to accept her help each time, which is tricky because you can easily initiate boss fights before seeing her. I once met her after falling into the boss's pit and finishing it, at which point I'm not sure the option could even register. It's not a critical issue since you have alternate ways to get her rewards, but it is disappointing that a long-running questline is so arbitrarily easy to botch. While some of the buggy shortcomings from the first game carried over to this one, they feel much more limited and ignorable this time. The edges are sawn off enough that what were once serious impediments to enjoyment have become mere nitpicks. 
I thought the first Blasphemous was one of the best indie Metroidvanias I'd played, but with the second I don't need to use a qualifier. It is the best. The Game Kitchen has demonstrated virtuosity over Metroidvania world design and has given the genre its new masterpiece. The game has a few too many scuffs to consider it perfect, but I think it definitely edges out every other modern heavyweight, like Metroid Dread. The absolute only reason I wouldn't universally recommend this game is that it may be too gross and violent for some, but again, it's gross and violent in an artful and justified way. Blasphemous 2 turned out so well that I'm split about whether I even want a third, since there's so little room to improve the formula from here. But whatever they do next, I think the Game Kitchen deserves your attention. You are an even worse critic than you are a player!